message is brought to you by Ven Moody and the Worship Center Christian Church, where we are committed to honoring God, unifying communities, and building people. We hope you enjoy this message, and thank you for supporting our ministry. All these books are the same. If I've read one, I have read them all. Financial independence, does it really exist? Debt freedom must only be a dream. Investing, not my money. I mean, do you know how volatile the stock market can be? I need something different, something different than what I've tried in the past. But what could it be? I'm excited to share uh, the word with you. We are in a series entitled, entitled Different. We're in a series entitled Different. Um, why is this series called Different? Because in order to win financially, you're going to have to be different. There was a very recent USA Today uh, poll or stat that was released, and it said that nearly 70% of all Americans, 70% of the people in America don't have $1,000 saved in the bank. Nearly 70%. I want you to wrap your head around this. Think about how many people are in our country and think about how many people are in that 70% that don't have $1,000 saved uh, in any of their uh, accounts. And it went on to say that in addition to that, Another 44% of people, out of that 70, 44% of people um, could not put their hands on $400 in a dire emergency. And so I want to share this with you because that's why this series is called Different. Because, because if you're going to win financially, if you're going to be healthy financially, if you're going to have a year that's greater than any other time in your past financially, you're going to have to be different. Because it is clear that doing it the world's way is not working. When 70% of people don't even have $1,000 saved, clearly doing it the world's way is not working. And so in order to do it God's way, it calls for us to be different. Somebody shout different. And being different is more a matter of your heart than anything else. Being different is, is more a matter of your heart, your heart, more than anything else. Financial health and doing it God's way is, is about 90% your heart and 10% your head. It's about 90% your heart and 10% and your head, meaning you can have all of the head knowledge. You can know all of the, the right things to do, and you can read all the books, and you can, you can know all of the right principles but if your heart is not right, you won't see the benefit of those principles that you're trying to live by. It's kind of like, you know, if you set a boat or a plane on autopilot, it is going to go in one direction. Now, you could struggle and try to turn the boat or try to turn the plane in another direction, but every time you let go, it's going to correct and go back in that direction that it is set for on autopilot. Your heart is the autopilot of your life. Your heart is the navigational system of your life. And what so many of us try to do is we try to strain to turn our life in a different direction by way of principles, by way of head knowledge. But the best way to do it is to change the autopilot, to adjust the direction of our life by dealing with our heart. And so that's what this series is about. This series is not about dollars. It's not about cents. It's not about uh, particular amounts. And it's not about any of that. This series is about the condition of your heart before God. How's your heart before God? And that's what we want to deal with today. We want to talk about, as we go further in this series, we want to talk for a few moments about the fact that it's a heart issue. It's a heart issue. Somebody say, it's a heart issue. I know this is, this is one, of, one of the services that some people say, well, I just want to get the word, but I need to hear you. I need to hear you. Amen. Say, it's a heart issue. It's a heart. There you go. There you go. Look at Luke chapter 6 and verse 36. Look at Luke chapter 6 
And let's start in verse 36. And I want you to see this. Luke chapter 6 and, and verse 36. And this is Jesus talking. And he says this. He says, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Now, we get to a verse that many people have heard before. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, I want you to notice that in these verses that we just read, that Jesus, who was talking, never mentions anything in these verses about money. I want you to notice this. Yet, yet it, it, many times, the reason I want you to notice this is because for many people, when they hear or when they read or when they talk about, uh, particularly Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, uh, we often think that Jesus is talking about this verse in the context of money. And so often, when, when we start talking about money, often this is one of those verses that we go grab. Give, and it'll be given back to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over. But what I want you to notice is that nowhere in these verses does Jesus ever mention money. Now, there are two things I, I want to make sure that you get from these verses. Jesus is teaching a principle. Somebody say, he's teaching a principle. And he's also dealing with an issue. Say, he's dealing with an issue. Yes. The, the, the two things that I want you to see here. Jesus is teaching a principle, but he's also dealing with an issue. But the principle he's teaching and the issue that he is dealing with is much bigger than the subject of money. And it becomes really clear when you zoom out and see the entire context out of which Jesus is teaching. You'll miss it if you go directly to Luke 6, verse 38. But if you zoom out, you'll see that he's talking about something bigger than money. Go back for a second to verse 36 of Luke 6. He says, be merciful, be merciful, be merciful just as your father is merciful. Then he goes on and says, and listen, don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't, don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And then he goes on and says, give and it'll be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. It'll be poured into your lap. For the same measure that you use, it will be measured and used uh, um, back uh, unto you. Are you following me? So he's not talking about money per se. But he's dealing with an issue that is much bigger. So the, the, the biblical principle that Jesus is teaching, first and foremost is he's teaching about the, the principle of sowing and reaping. He's teaching about the principle of sowing and reaping. This is why he says, give, and it will be given unto you. He says, literally, whatever it is that you give, you're going to get more of that in return. Give and it will be given back to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. For the measure you use, it'll be measured back unto you. He's literally saying, whatever it is that you give, by way of the principle of sowing and reaping, in Genesis, is called uh, the law of seed time and harvest. God established the universe so that, so that those things will always remain. He says, and the way that the principle works is that whatever you give, you're going to get more of it back in return. So, so I've got an apple up here. Think about this for a second. If, if you and I were to sow just one seed or a couple of seeds from this apple, we are not just going to get one apple back. You're going to get an apple tree. And, and out of that apple tree, as the tree grows and the branches sprout out, guess what you're going to get? You're going to get numerous apples. Why? Because that is one of the laws by which God created the universe and this is what what jesus is talking about whatever you give you are going to get back more of that in return Tr true story true story a woman recently um, came to see a, a pastor and 
and she was a single mom and didn't have anybody uh, to really look for look out for her kids or care for her kids during this counseling session she had three kids and and so the pastor said well just just bring your kids and and uh, my, my assistant or the receptionist uh, will, 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 will watch the kids while, while you and I have this counseling session. And so sure enough, she, she, brings, she brings her three kids and, and she, she leaves them with the receptionist. She goes in um, to see the pastor and the pastor said, you know, what's going on? How can I help you? And she said, I just, she said, my kids yell at me, pastor. My kids yell at me and, and I just, I, I, need, I need help, I need prayer. I, I just don't know what, why, they, why they are so defiant and why they, why they yell at me. And the kids were making noise in the hallway, and this is what she did. She turned and she said, I'm sorry, Pastor. Hey, shut up! Don't you know I'm talking to the pastor? She turned back around and said, I just don't know, Pastor, why they yell at me. I just, I just, I just, I just don't get it. I mean, they're always yelling at me. Because whatever it is that you give, you're going to get back more of it in return. Give and it will be given unto you. Yell and yelling will be given back to you. But the problem, listen to me, the problem with this though is that so many people use this verse as the motivation for giving. Meaning, meaning, there are so many people that, that use this verse as the impetus, as the motivation for giving, meaning the only reason that they give anything is so that they can get stuff back in return. But what Jesus is teaching is, yes, he's teaching that this principle of sowing and reaping, but what he is teaching when he says, give and it shall be given back to you, he is teaching that this is the reward for giving. It should not be the motivation. Teach Pastor Van. But unfortunately, for so many people, the only reason they give anything, the only reason they give love, the only reason they give kindness, the only reason they give patience, the only reason they give anything is because they want something in return. And listen to me. When your motivation is wrong, even when you are doing the right thing, the outcome will not be what you want it to be. Teach Pastor Van, I believe that I'm doing it. I know a number of people who are doing the right things, but because they are doing it for the wrong reasons, they are not getting their results and their desired outcome. Just last week, somebody came up to me, I was, I was in the lobby shaking hands, and they said, Pastor, I'm so glad you started this series. Thank you so much. They said, because, you know, we've been doing some of the right things. We've been doing the right things, but, you know, I'm so glad that you focused on the heart. They said, because I, I, I really think that, that our heart was not right, which is why we haven't seen some of the results that we are, we are believing God for. See, I want you to understand that God is more concerned about the heart, the motivation behind it. As a matter of fact, Proverbs 16 and verse 2 literally says it. It says, all a man's ways seem innocent to him. That's, that's the way many of us go through. Oh, it's not a big deal. This shouldn't be that big a challenge because, because they seem innocent to us. But watch what it says. But motives are what? Weighed by the Lord. God is looking behind the action. Yeah, he sees the action. He sees what you're doing. But he's looking behind that, looking at the heart of it. James, even 4, in verse 3, James says this because James is ministering to believers and some of them have said James I don't get it we're praying and we're asking and we know we know we have not because we ask not and so we're praying and we're asking and we're declaring by faith but we don't see the results and James says the problem is when you ask you don't receive why because you ask with the wrong motives your main motivation is to spend what you get on your pleasures it's not about what God wants and I want you to hear this when it comes to, to pleasing God when it comes to doing things his way it is not just a matter of doing the right things it's also about having the right motivation and so I told you I told you in this passage that Jesus is is teaching a principle somebody say he's teaching a principle 
But I also told you he's dealing with an issue. Somebody say he's dealing with an issue. What's the principle he's teaching? The principle he's teaching is, is sowing and reaping. But the issue that he is dealing with that is at the core of this entire passage is the motivations of your heart. And you really see this when you back up and you see the full context of the message that Jesus is talking and sharing. You, you miss it if you jump right to verse 38. Give and it will be given back to you. Press down, shake. You, you miss it. But if you back up and see the entire context, it is painfully obvious. As a matter of fact, let, let's do that for a second. Go back to Luke 6 and let's back up even more to verse 30. Go to Luke 6 and let's back up even more to verse 30. And here's what Jesus is saying. He, he says, listen, give to everyone who asks you. And if anyone takes what belongs to you, do not demand it back. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If, if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what credit is that to you? Even sinners do that. And if you lend to those from whom you expect repayment, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners expecting to be repaid in full, but love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great and your children will be like the Most High because he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Then he goes on and says, and be merciful just like your father's mercy. Then he goes on and says, and give and it will be given back to you. Do you see it now? Do, do you see it? Come on, talk to me. Do, do you see the real point of Jesus' message? The real point of Jesus' message is to give. Give, give. He says, he says give, give to those who ask you. Give to those who cannot, who cannot repay you. Give love to those who don't deserve it. Be, give, give mercy to those who, who have wronged you. Uh, the real message that Jesus is, is preaching here is give, 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 give. Give, 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 and don't even worry about whether or not they can pay you back. Give even when they have wronged you and, and done stuff wrong to you. Give, give, give when they're not even treating you the way you want to be treated. Give, 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 give. And by the way, he closes it by saying, and when you give, whatever it is that you give will be given back to you, ah, but not the same way you gave it. Whatever you give will be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He says, the whole point is give, 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 give. Don't, don't give contingent on what they do, how they treat you. Give. And when you give, God your heavenly father will make sure that whatever it is that you've given, you will get back so much more in return. Teach, Pastor. I, um, last year, there was a, a stewardship company that uh, we have a great relationship with. And they were talking to Minister Sly King, who's our online campus minister. And he was sharing with them some of the, the teachings that I've done over the years on, on this subject of stewardship and, and, and doing it God's way. And they were very intrigued. And they said, well, we want to come and interview your pastor and, and, and you know, make him a part of this podcast or blog or what have you. And so they did. They, they came to Birmingham and uh, we sat in, in uh, Dream Team Central and they just, they asked uh, several questions and they were really intrigued because they said, you know, so many pastors don't want to deal with this issue because as I said last week, it's, it's one of the biggest areas of need for many people, but nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to teach it. Nobody wants to hear messages on it because it's such a touchy subject. And, you know, so many people just, just don't want to receive it. And they said, so, so how do you talk about this difficult subject? How, how do you do it? And, and they said, you know, so I mentioned some things to us and we were so intrigued by it. They said, what, what's your approach? What's your heart on the issue? And I said, well, the Bible is very clear that it's not about money. The Bible is so clear that this is not a money issue, but it's a spiritual growth issue. The Bible is very clear that it's not a money issue, it's a discipleship issue. Meaning if you don't grow to the place where you get this right, 
Nothing else in your life will make sense. What, what do you mean, Pastor? Well, you cannot do marriage well if you're not a giver. If you are a taker, and if all you want is what you want, when you want it, how you want it, and if you are your only focus, you will tear a marriage up. I've sat down with so many couples, and they complain and fight and bicker towards each other, and the real reason is because both of them are takers. Nobody's a giver. If you, if you don't get this right, you can't be a good employee. Because nobody wants to work with other people who are only thinking about themselves. Teach, Pastor Van. If you don't get this right, you can't be a great friend. Who wants to have a friend that doesn't care about them and only cares about themselves? Teach, Pastor. You, if you don't get this right, you can't run a successful business. Because nobody wants to work for a boss that's only concerned about them. Teach, Pastor Van. The whole point that Jesus is making here is that it is about your heart. If you are still a taker, and if you don't adopt the heart that God wants to be a giver, then nothing will work. And I've shared all of that with you to get here because God is very clear that if we're going to develop the right heart, there are a few things that we have to address. There are a few things that we have to deal with. And God pointed them out all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. And I love the book of Deuteronomy. Jesus would often quote from the book of Deuteronomy when Jesus was being tempted by the enemy in the wilderness. He, he quoted from the book of Deuteronomy. Why? Because in the book of Deuteronomy, uh, God gives principles and laws about, about how to live successfully. And he gives them to the children of Israel right before they go into the land. God literally says, I'm getting ready to change your life. I'm getting ready to bring you into something that is greater than anything you've ever experienced. But I got to teach you how to handle it. Because if your heart's not right, you're going to get in the land and you're going to mess it up. And so, and so look with me at Deuteronomy 15. And verse, and verse 7, he says, listen, if there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in the land which the Lord your God has given you, he says, listen, in this land that I'm bringing you into, if you, if you encounter somebody that is poor, he says, you shall not harden your heart. You see that? He's talking about the heart. He says, nor shut your hand from your poor brother. But you shall open your hand wide to him and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. God says, you're getting ready to go into the land. I am blessing you with this land. I am bringing you into a land that you did not deserve. You're going to live in houses that you did not build, but I got to make sure your heart is right. When you get into the land and you encounter somebody that is in need, he says, don't harden your heart. Make sure your heart is right. So, so how do we make sure that our heart is positioned for everything that God wants to do in, around us, and through us? Number one, you got to deal with a selfish heart. Number one, you got to deal with a selfish heart. Let's, let's go back to Deuteronomy 15. Let's pick it up at verse 9 because God goes on and says, Beware, lest there be a wicked thought in your heart saying... The seventh year, the year of release is at hand, and your eye be evil against your poor brother, and you give him nothing, and he cry out to the Lord against you, and it becomes sin among you. Let, let me explain this. God set up an economic system that was designed in such a way that every seven years, debts were canceled. That's what, that's what the seventh year or the year Jubilee, um, which is a combination of those sevens. But every seven years, debts were canceled. How many of you would, would like for God to reinstitute that? Amen? Yeah, I mean, come on, come on. Great, amen. But incidentally, incidentally, this is why negative things drop off of your credit report every seven years. Because it goes all the way back to the laws that God established. And so here's what God is saying. God is saying, if one of your brothers comes up to you in this land, and maybe he didn't have a good crop that year, or maybe he is struggling, uh, maybe his sheep died, or maybe he's just got a need, and he says, and he comes up to you, he says, don't think and be selfish and say, well, now, if I loan this money to him, because in six months, we're coming up on the seventh year, and all debts are going to be canceled, he says, don't, don't think, well, no, I'm not going to give it to him, because he won't be able to repay the debt. 
God is saying, don't, don't, don't do that, lest your eye be evil against your brother. And he cry out to the Lord against you, and, and it becomes sin among you. God is saying, when your brother comes to you and you have a need, don't think, no, I'm not going to do this because he may not be able to pay me back. God, God is saying, no, I want you to be generous. And notice what God calls selfishness in Deuteronomy 15 and 9. He calls it wickedness. He says, don't, 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 be, don't, be, don't be wicked. Don't, don't be wicked. God is saying, I want you to be like me. I want you to be generous. I'm bringing you into a land that you didn't deserve. I'm bringing you into a job that the truth is, yeah, you went to school, but you really are still not qualified for. I'm bringing you into an area of blessing that, 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 that you can't even fix your lips to say that you deserve. And God is saying, I'm doing this for you, and I want you to have my heart towards everybody else. I want you to be generous. I, I asked you last Sunday, I asked you, why did you think God created the tithe? And, and I told you the answer, that God created the tithe so that we could live by faith. I want to ask you a deeper question today. Why do you think the Bible talks so much about giving? Why do, why do you think that the Bible talks so much about giving? Th think about this. Out of the 38 parables that Jesus taught, 16 of them was about money and possessions. Why do you think the Bible talks so much about giving? There are a little over 500 verses on faith in the whole Bible. There, there are uh, somewhere around 500 or so verses on prayer in the entire Bible. But watch this. There are over 2,000 verses in the Bible about money and possessions. Why do you think the Bible talks so much about giving? I'll give you the answer. Because God wants us to be like him. What he's after is not our money. He wants our heart to look like Jesus. I, I, I didn't put this in your notes, but I referred to it on last week. Just write it somewhere in the margin in your Bible or type it into your message notes. Romans 8 and verse 29, it literally says, For those that God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed into the image and likeness of his son, Jesus Christ, so that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. brethren. What does that mean? Even before you were uh, an idea in your mama's head or your dad's head, even before you were in your mama's belly, God ordained it so that he would conform you into looking more and more like Jesus. So if you want to know why there are certain challenges, why there are certain hurdles, God, why have you taken my life in this path, in this direction? Because ultimately, he says, I want you to look more and more like Jesus. And he can't do that without dealing with your heart. And can I tell you something? Giving, giving more than anything else that you will do. Giving works selfishness and greed out of your life. Let me say that again. More than anything else, giving, giving will work selfishness and greed out of your life. This is why. If you are giving and if you're doing things for God and other people just to get stuff for yourself, your heart is not where it needs to be for what God wants to do in your life. And if you're giving, if you're doing stuff for God, if you're doing stuff for other people just to get, here's what it means. It means that selfishness and greed is still controlling your heart. Teach, Pastor. I have never... I've never met a generous person who was not blessed. Okay, let me say it another way. Let me say it another way. The most blessed people that I have ever been around are the most generous, the most blessed organizations, the most blessed people, the most blessed churches that I've ever been around are at the same time the most generous. We had an amazing financial conference on yesterday and our keynote speaker was, was my dear spiritual brother, 
Pastor DeAndre Salter from New Jersey in the Impact Church. And, and he, I love it. I didn't even ask him to do it, but he did it anyway and, and, and shared his testimony and, and talked in one of the sessions about how at 22 years old, because he was doing it the world's way and the wrong way, how he had to file for bankruptcy, but, but how uh, literally 10 years later, God, God blessed him to become a multimillionaire and to have this boutique minority insurance firm that specialized in a really niche area area of insurance and it was the largest minority owned insurance company in the world God took him from bankruptcy to being a multimillionaire. but what a lot of people don't know because we spent time together our families traveled together he is one of the most generous people I know do you hear what I'm saying to you God is after your heart now I don't have a testimony like Pastor Salter's but I do have a testimony about how God's changed my heart. I do, I do have that testimony. Because one of the big areas of selfishness for me was not with money, it was my food. Okay, I guess, you know, yeah, yeah, okay. Y'all don't want to be honest about it. Some of the men understand what I'm talking about. I mean, I remember when I took my wife out on our first date. I tell you, our first date, we went to church, and then we went to a really nice restaurant. And we sat down, and, you know, I wanted to make it really special, and I was getting to know her. And, and, so, and so she ordered. Um, what she wanted and then it was time for me to order and I ordered and then she said oh that's so good because I wanted to try that and I was looking like wait a minute I don't even know you that well and you trying to get off in my plate like that I would literally I, eat like she said oh can I try ah. if you wanted this this was my big argument if you wanted this why do you order it I, I guess I'm the only person that's ever struggled with that you know, I mean, we go into the drive through and I'd say, yeah, sweetie, do you want anything? No, I'm okay. I'll just have what you're having. I'm like, the devil is a liar. If you want something, you better, I will buy you two order fries, but you're not having my fries. And the fries that fall in the bottom of the bag, they belong to me too. I'm just calling right now. Uh, any of the brothers know what I'm talking about up in here, up in here? But, but, but thanks be to God, he has, he has worked on my heart. Now I'm like, sweetie, would you, would, you, would you like it? And she gets so tickled. She's like, ooh, the Lord's done a work in your heart. I'm like, I know. I know. I know. But what am I telling you? Number one, you got to deal with a selfish heart. Number two, number two, you got to deal with a grieving heart. Number two, you got to deal with a grieving heart. I'm, I'm almost out of time. Let me, let me give this to you. You got to deal with a grieving heart. Look at uh, verse 10 of Deuteronomy 15. It says, you shall surely, God has still given us principles. He says, you shall surely give to him, and your heart should not be, what, grieved when you give to him. Because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all of your works and all you put your hands to. Do you see this? God says, if you learn to give with the right heart, God says, I promise that I'll bless everything that you do. That is a promise that God makes. But God says, here's the thing though, you can't be selfish, number one, in your heart. He says, but then, but then don't allow your heart to grieve after you've been obedient in giving. And by grieving, what God is talking about is, don't, don't let your heart start grieving over what you could have done with the money if you would have kept it for yourself. This is so good, I'm gonna get this series for myself. Have, have you ever thought of yourself, do you know what I could have done with that? See, here's the thing. Selfishness can attack us before we give. Mm -hmm. But grieving can attack us after we give. Teach, 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 Pastor Van. Have you ever given a large amount or done something big for somebody else? And then right after you do it, something breaks or falls apart in your own life? And then, and, then, and then what starts happening? You know, the enemy starts rushing in, and the enemy starts talking to you, saying, now see, if you hadn't done that for them, see, you would have had the money to get your car fixed. Come on, teach, Pastor Van. And, and can I be honest with you? This is where I would often get tripped up. When I, when I first started trying to do it God's way, my first struggle was selfishness. When I, my first job, I, man, I would save money, like it was nobody's business to the degree that my mother would sometimes have to come to me and borrow money. And she said, baby, can mama have some money? I said, well, sit down, mom. Let's, let's talk about the terms. 
<laughs> and exactly how much do you think you need? Now, are you sure it's $45? Because I really think you can get away with about 30 I mean, you know, I was selfish. But then after I got out of selfishness and I started doing it God's way, I didn't see the biblical results. You know why? Because I was grieving. So I would, I would give to others. I would, I would give to the Lord. And then the whole ride home, man, I wanted to buy some shoes, but I had to give to the Lord. And, and I, would, I, would be, I would be grieving. This is why the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. This is why, this is why you, you ought not allow anybody to browbeat you or make you feel guilty about giving because there are a lot of people that give because they feel like they have to and not because they want to. But the problem is, if you don't give with the right heart and you're grieving even after you give, you're not going to see the benefits uh, that you were giving for in the first place. Because God is saying, I, I, I don't want you to do it and, and be selfish and, and grieve. As a man, you know what? Don't go. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sitting here talking about uh, money and giving, and I just realized I left my wallet. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. All right, what was I? Um, so God doesn't. Oh, thank you, man. God, appreciate. It. Thank you, Roosevelt. G give him a hand. He, he's such a good servant. He just, you know, wanted to run up and wow, give me a hundred dollars. Now, let's talk about this for a second. The reason he ran up here so quickly and gave me $100 when I made that statement is because this morning I gave him this $100. You're laughing, but here's the point. He wasn't grieving when he came up here to give me this $100. He wasn't saying, I really don't want to give past this money, but since he's left his wallet at home, I may as well. No, no, no. He wasn't grieving. Why? Because this wasn't his to begin with. Maybe you'll get this on Tuesday. What, what I want you to understand is that the way that you deal with a grieving heart is to have the right perspective about money. The Bible says that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. It is not yours. And the reason we grieve so much, God, you know how good don't have money, is because we think it's ours. But here's the good news. When you understand that it's God's, you move out of a limited economy into an unlimited economy. Let me explain it to you. You do understand that the world system is based on supply and demand. And when there is a limited supply, the demand goes up. But in God's economy, there is an unlimited supply. So I don't ever have to worry about running out because he owns a cattle on a thousand hills. The silver is his. The gold is his. So God, I can freely give to others. I can freely give and not worry about my needs not being met because you promised to supply all of my needs according to his riches and glory. So number one, you got to develop. You got you to deal with rather a selfish heart. You got to deal with number two, a grieving heart. But then number three, you've got to develop a generous heart. Drop down to Deuteronomy 15 and verse 14. And he says this, you shall supply him liberally. Talking about the poor among you or the one that is in need. He says you should supply him liberally from your flock, from your threshing floor, from your wine press. For from what the Lord your God has blessed you with, you shall give it to him. God says, you shall supply him liberally. That means you ought, to be, you ought to be generous. From what? From what the Lord has blessed you with. God wants us to be generous. And I know this is an area where many people will go quiet and not want to receive this because often we are only focused on ourselves. But God says, that's not my will for you. I want you to be, I want you to be generous. And here's the thing. We are born selfish. But when we're born again, we ought to be generous. And what is required to go from selfishness to, to being generous is a renewed mind. Let this mind be in you that was also in Christ Jesus. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. 
That's why I know I took a little bit more time, but I wanted you to see the entire context of Luke 6. That's why uh, we didn't just start at Luke 6, 38, but we backed all the way up to verse 30 because I wanted you to get the heart of what Jesus was saying. Give, give. He's saying give to those that can't repay you. Give to those that are in need. Give mercy and kindness even when people have not been merciful and kind to you. He's saying give because I want you to be generous. I want you to have my heart. And parents... Isn't it interesting that this is one of the first, most important, and most difficult things that you have to teach your children? Parents, you know this. You know this. One of of the first things and, and one of the most difficult things that you have to teach your children is to share. You end, up, you end up saying it over and over, share, share Johnny, share, share, Johnny, share, share, J- share, Johnny, share, sh- j- share, share, Johnny, come on, share, Johnny, we talked about this, share, what does mommy want you to do, share, it's interesting when, when my kids were, were smaller and they'd play with their friends and the neighbors and we set up, you know, play dates and all of that, um, they'd be playing with something and and one of their little friends would come over and, and then they'd run over to, to, to the toy that their other friend picks up. He says, no, no, I was playing with that, I was playing with that, I was playing with that. <laughs> then their friend would go over to pick up another toy. They'd run over, no, 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 I was playing with that, I was playing with that, I was playing with that, I was playing with that. <laughs> then, then the kid goes and gets up, picks up something else. And they run over, I was playing with that, I was playing with that, I was playing, mine, mine, it's mine. Do you realize what the Lord is saying to his children? When are you going to grow up? When, when, when are you, you going to grow up and be like your father who so loved the world that he gave? One of the proudest moments in my life as a, as a, as a father was one day when we were leaving the summit. We had taken the kids to get some lunch. I think we had gone to the movies. And we were leaving the summit. And I don't know, I, I, I haven't seen this since, but, but right there at the corner of exiting the summit in 280, we were sitting at the light getting ready to turn left so we can get on 459. And there was a homeless person right there. And he was asking for help. And, and my kids were in the back seat, and I was in the front seat, and they saw him, and they said, Daddy, what's wrong? Why, why is he standing out there? Why does he look this, that bad? I said, baby, he's homeless. He doesn't, he doesn't have anywhere to go. And they started weeping. They just, they just started weeping uncontrollably. And I said, guys, you don't have to cry. We're, we're going to give something to him. We're, we're going we're gonna to see how we can help him. And I, and I dug money out of my pocket, and... And, and he came up to the car, and I gave him something, and I said, prayed for him, said, God bless you, sir, and told him about the church and said, if you need anything else, please reach out to us, blah, 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 blah. And, and then the light changed, and, and we had to go, and my kids were just crying uncontrollably. And they just said, Dad, I don't know, why, why, does he, why doesn't he have a place? Can we bring him home with us? Daddy, we have to do more. And we got home, and they went and got their little piggy, piggy banks, and, and they, they said, Dad, can we, can we go back? Can we, give him, can we give him everything that we have? That was one of my most proudest moments because I said to myself, God, thank you because they, they're getting it. That's what God wants. That's what God wants. He, 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 he wants us to be generous and to give like he gave and continues to give. So what do you have to do? Your heart's going to be right. You, you got to deal with the selfish heart. You got to deal with the grieving heart. You got to develop a generous heart. But then lastly, as I'm closing, you got to develop a grateful heart. Verse 15, it says this, Deuteronomy 15 and 15. God says, you shall remember that you were slave in the land of Egypt and the Lord your God redeemed you. Therefore, 
I command you this thing today. God says, I am commanding you to deal with a selfish heart, to deal, to, to deal with a grieving heart. I'm commanding you to develop a generous heart. I'm, I'm commanding you to, be, to, to do this, to, to help others. I'm commanding you to do it. Why? Because you got to remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. You got to remember that there was a time when you didn't have anything. You got to remember that I brought you out of nothing into something. And, and so, if, if you're grateful, then I'm commanding you to give back to others. God is saying, I'm commanding you to be generous. I'm commanding you to not be selfish and to not grieve because, because you used to be a slave. This is one of the reasons why I'm so grateful for our church and the freedom that we have even in worship. I grew up in, I grew up in church where, where the only expression at the height of worship was you had to dance and the musicians would play the same thing. Dun, 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 you know, and, and I was struggling as a kid because I couldn't get my dance right. Because I came up in a church that I felt like the only way for me to express gratitude and whenever the Holy Spirit was moving, everybody danced. And so, and so if I couldn't dance, then it must have meant that the Holy Spirit wasn't moving in my heart. But then I grew up and understood that there's so many if, if, different expressions of what will happen when the Holy Spirit begins to move. Uh, and for me, sometimes I will dance, but, but more often than not, I just start weeping. More often than not... In, in, in moments of praise and worship, I get so overcome that I just start weeping. More often than not, in my own prayer time, early in the morning at 5 a.m. when I get up and start my day with the Lord and I'm praying and I, I just will start weeping when I think about what God has done in my life. When, when, when I go back to Atlanta and visit my mom and visit my dad, I, I, I cannot help. When I'm driving through the city, to just say, God, I'm so thankful. Because, because what y'all don't know, y'all see Pastor Van on this side. But what you don't know are, are the days when I was, when I was so in the world. When, when, when I was literally headed for destruction. When, when there were things that I knew were wrong, but I did them anyway. And it was the grace of God that, that, I, that, I, wasn't, that I wasn't shot. It was the grace of God that, that, that I didn't contract age or illness. And, and it's the grace of God that I'm not either dead or in prison. And so I don't have a problem giving. Whatever God says, give. I'm, I'm God, what do you want me to give? I'm like, God, whatever you need me to do. Why? Because I'm so grateful. Because he took me from being a slave. He took me from being in bondage to so many things. And he set me free. You know, whenever I run into people whose heart is still controlled by selfishness or even a heart that's grieving, you know what I realize? I realize that they're still stuck there because either they don't know or they've forgotten. enjoyed this message. For more resources, visit the worship center cc.org and vanmoody.org. You will also find Van Moody on all social media platforms. Again, we thank you for your support.